Hi, Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself, co-founder, executive vice president, and chief medical officer of the nonprofit CLL Society here at ASH 2024 in San Diego, California. Hello, my name is Jacob Garcia. I'm a pediatric oncologist by training, uh, native of California. I'm currently the senior vice president of clinical development and operations at Umoja Biopharma. Hi, my name is Ryan Larson, Senior Vice President and Head of Research at Emoja Biopharma. The reason that I wanted you to talk to our community, our CLL community of patients, is because some of the research that you were presenting at ASH I thought was mind-blowing and a paradigm shift, just like CAR-T was originally a paradigm shift. But maybe I'll turn to you first. And for Patients who maybe aren't that familiar with CAR-T, tell us what CAR-T is and then maybe you can talk a little bit, either one of you, about what's revolutionary about the way you're doing it. Sure. So um, CAR-T cell therapy has really revolutionized particularly hematological malignancies or blood cancers, so leukemias and lymphomas. Um, that's been over the last decade or so or more. The first patients were uh, pediatric, really, and because the need uh, there in pediatric ALL in particular was so great, but that's really expanded and brought into um, indications or diseases like large B-cell lymphoma, which is a pretty common type of lymphoma, and CLL, or chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, that said, uh, cell therapies are a way of harnessing your own immune system to fight your cancer, so we, uh, we, anyone who's undergoing this therapy, you would, we would collect your white blood cells. Um, we would isolate the ones that are called lymphocytes. They're um, particularly amenable to this process. They go to a lab, they're engineered, or uh, proteins are basically forced to be expressed on those cells, on the outside of those cells that can then recognize your cancer and hopefully destroy those cancer cells and, and render you disease free. So that's essentially what a CAR T cell is. Um, the Parts of that that are um, sort of onerous and, and hard on patients, the collection of the cells. There's a need right now to give what's called lymphodepleting chemotherapy or you know additional chemotherapy to you before you can get those cells. So that's added toxicity and, and potential risk to a patient. And so um, I'll let Ryan explain the the goal of our company has really been to get rid of a lot of those barriers and to create a therapy that would allow CAR T cells to be available to more patients. And let me add, too, that while it's been revolutionary in some cancers and for some CLL patients, um, we saw a presentation today from UPenn where some patients are more than 10 years out and doing great, the majority of patients do not benefit from this yet. The response rates are disappointingly low, and that's because our T cells, which are the kind of lymphocytes that are being genetically re-engineered, aren't so great. Um, they're exhausted. We have a, we have a cancer of the immune system. So, but you've got a whole different approach to this, it's, um, which is really exciting. So, you got the hard work of being explain this to patients because <laughs> I want to I want to understand it too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so Jacob pointed out the onerous aspect of the current class of CAR T cells. We call them ex vivo manufactured CAR T cells, which means out of the body, which means outside of the body. Correct. Um, and while those therapies have been transformational in a subset of disease indications and a subset of patients, many challenges still remain. One of them being uh, access. Um, due to the complexity, cost, the onerous nature of the ex vivo process, um, it creates many challenges, coupled with lymphodepleting chemotherapy, many challenges for patients to need to access those therapies. So one of the, the key areas of focus and principles for Emotia Biopharma is to enable access to these potentially transformative therapies through delivering what we call our VivoVec technology, which is a surface engineered viral particle that's introduced directly to the patient with the intent being that these transformational CAR T cells are essentially manufactured in the patient's own body. So bypassing all of the requirements for um, cell collection ex vivo manufacturing, potential bridging therapies. There's no need for um, lymphodepleting chemotherapy. 
directly introducing this genetic material to the patient's T cells selectively, um, such that those T cells can then expand and kill the tumor in the patient's own body. Again, bypassing all of the, the onerous and com complex issues that Jacob highlighted. And if I may just to add a little bit of clarification to that for, for patients particularly. So what, so you mentioned, you referred to this as cell therapy. So these are not cell therapies what we're, we're working on. We're actually working on an engineered virus. So it sounds a little scary, but the virus is engineered to go directly to T cells and convert those to cancer fighting cells. So we're skipping the part of collecting your cells, manufacturing as Ryan alluded to, and introducing a virus that is programmed essentially to go directly to the T cells and create cancer fighting cells. Which sounds like magic, sort of. But it's yeah, and, and a little scary. So yes. let's talk a little bit about what was presented today, okay. which was a study in non-human primates, which is uh, as close as you can get to doing the human studies, and it was pretty promising and reassuring. I don't know which one of you want to take that. That came out of Ryan Shops. Ha yeah. happy, happy to take it, yeah. So, um, uh, as Dr. Kaufman mentioned, we, we performed um, extensive studies in non human primate models um, and demonstrating, one, that all of the key elements of the CAR T cell mechanism of action um, are maintained. So, we see really nice CAR T cell expansion. Um, we see eradication of their targets um, in, in the, the non-human primates, and the in direct in vivo injection of the vivovac or lentiviral particles is very well tolerated. So um, we see no evidence of overt toxicity or anything related to um, off-target biodistribution that would raise any concern about the direct injection of these particles into the primates, and we expect that to translate very well into humans as we move into clinical trials. I already know the answer to this question because I asked it to the presenter at, the, at ASH, but I'm going to ask you. You do see this, the cytokine release syndrome in, in these non-human primates. You do see signs of the inflammation. Uh, fevers, other things like that. Tell us a little bit about what happens. Correct, yeah. So, so what happens with a typical immune response when you have expanding CAR T cells, um, the patients in, in these non-human primates also experience some degree of inflammation that's associated with a fever and elevation of some factors that are indicative of this infl inflammatory response. We see that actually as um, evidence that the CAR T cells are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They are um, driving inflammation that is against the, um, the intended cells to, to, that they want to be killing in those primates. And, and the same happens in humans that are experiencing CAR T cell therapy in terms of those CAR T cells eradicating the tumor. So anytime you have an immune response, there's an associated inflammatory response. Now, impor importantly, this inflammatory response is, is transient and resolving. So the, the animals, um, experience a mild uh, inflammatory response uh, highlighted by fever, elevation of some serum protein levels, and that is transient resolves um, very quickly actually after the CAR T cells contract. So let's talk about one on-target effect and, and the risk of off-target effects. So these um, uh, non-human primates were, um, didn't have B cells. It kills off the good and bad B cells, which is successful which is a success, and that's been a problem with all kinds of CAR T's, if you could just touch on that a little bit. But I guess the big concern is, and I'm sure this is just my concern to you as a company's concern, the FDA's concern, patient's concern, is how do I know it's this viral genetic information is just going to be integrated into my T cells, how it's not going to go into my liver, my brain, my lungs, Talk to me about that. Sure. Reassure me about that. Yeah, so, so I'll address the first part and I'll let Ryan answer the second part. So the, the targets right now that are most common on things like CLL, large B-cell lymphoma, these are derived from normal, normally normal healthy B-cells. So T lymphocytes are what we're using to make CAR T-cells. B-cells are, the in this case, the malignant or the cancerous cells. Um, so we target things like CD19, which is a protein on the outside of, and CD20, which is a protein on the outside of B-cells. Um, in the case of this experiment, it's CD20 that we're targeting, but it could be any other B cell target. Um, those That is common to the malignant cells, but also normal healthy B cells. So the data you're referring to in the study, these were non-tumor bearing animals. They did not have cancer, but we see evidence of the target you know, killing mediated through the T cells 
on CD20 expressing cells, which in this case were normal B cells. So that's, the, that's what we saw. The B cell numbers went down as the CAR T cells went up. As those B cells go away, the T cells are no longer seeing the protein they're intending to kill, and so they contract and go away. So what you saw was a disappearance of those T cells as the B cell numbers drop, which is what we would expect in that experiment. And now it's your job to reassure me that this is going to stay on target. It's a little scary to think about voluntarily getting a virus that's a cousin to an HIV type virus. Objecting you know, genetic material. So yeah, I think the first point is that the element of it being a cousin, right? It's it's been um, substantially engineered away from being a, a typical HIV-like virus, such that it is not replication competent first and foremost. So replication competent. Put that into simpler language. So we yeah. So the 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 virus is not going to recreate itself after it's been introduced into the patient or okay. the T cell. Um, it's it's essentially a dead end virus, basically that will introduce this payload and stop there. Um, so the, the way that we achieve um, selective T cell transduction in the patient, the other element of on-target activity is we want to make sure um, that we're only engineering the T cells in, in the patient's body, or in this case, the non-human primate. Um, we have uh, created what we call surface engineering on the viral particle surface that um, drives the tropism of the virus. Tropism. Tropism is um, uh, selectively targeting the cell type of interest. Okay. Um, so as we're infusing these viral particles, whether it be um, intravenously or, or as we should have shown previously, intralymphatically, obviously there's the potential for the virus to be exposed to many different tissue and cell types. Um, importantly, the, the, um, the viral particle surface engineering drives and targets the particles selectively to T cells. So the particles will selectively bind to T cells, resulting in subsequent uh, delivery of the genetic payload and then CAR, chimeric antigen receptor expression, on the T cell surface selectively. And when you looked at the animal models, that's what you found. We you looked, find them in the liver or other places. We so I think an important um, uh, piece of information is that immune cells will traffic throughout the body. So we do find um, CAR T cells selectively transduced T cells throughout the body where they may, may have engaged a CD20 expressing B cell. But importantly, it's T cells. It's not the other tissue specific um, cell types. So it's always T cells. Um, it's not the uh, liver cells. It's not the kidney cells. It is the T cells that are being transduced. Now, my understanding is that you now have approval to start a first in human trial. I don't know which one you so want we, to take yeah, that. We, we applied for what's called an IND mm -hmm. with the FDA to um, begin testing one of our um, products, UBBV111, which is a C19 targeting um, payload, unlike the one we've just been discussing. Um, and we got clearance this summer to begin that trial. So Very exciting. Very so exciting. we'll stay in touch when we know about trial sites and Absolutely. what's going on there. Yeah. Uh, we have the information on clinicaltrials.gov if folks want to go there. We'll make sure we link when we put this article okay. up. Any final thoughts on this? And then I want to talk to you more about some other aspects. Uh, no, I think we, we really appreciate the, uh, your time today and being able to, to help um, get some more visibility on to the, this emerging technology. Um, we're super excited about the Open IND. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. We're very excited about this too, and we're, we love to bring to our patients what the latest, and even though this is years away, let's be honest, from you know being a, a trial that you, a, a drug that you can get in, uh, uh, from a local physician, it's very close to being something you could jump into a trial on, and I'm very big on clinical trials, so we're very excited about this, and this is a story that we'll be covering closely. Uh, thanks very much from ASH 2024.